The keynote speaker for first uh, session is Pavel uh, uh, Borecki. Uh, he is a, a co-founder and researcher at uh, Anthropo Pictures, which uh, is uh, focused on uh, primary research, applied anthropology, and consultancy services. Uh, I, I think he will tell us more about uh, this uh, uh, studio. And uh, his uh, uh, presentation, his contribution is uh, titled Why do we need to transform ur urban planners into vision builders? builders? So, Pavel, please. So, good morning, everyone. Well, um, thank you for the introduction. Well, it's not necessary for me to say more at this moment. Well, what I'm going to uh, talk about now, it's, it's a city on the point of view of social sciences. Well, at the beginning, I put those quotes. What is the city but the people? I guess you know this one. So, who is the, who is the author of this quote? Any ideas? No? Okay, William Shakespeare? Never mind. And uh, people, let's become manure of the city. It's a quote of Andrzej Kobza. Those who are familiar with, uh, with the Prague cultural scene, they, they, they might know him. It's a, he's a cultural producer and like a crazy guy. So he proposed to fertilize the city somehow, and I use it as an opening a si a slide. So, um, why do we need to transform urban planners into vision builders? Well, uh, due, to my, due to my applied researches, I realized, from the, as I said, from the point of view of social sciences, there might be some gaps in methodology of urban planning. Well, but I'm not an expert, so Please be patient with me if there is some technical mistake or a different, different understanding of term. Anyways, I think that we, we, can, we can somehow improve uh, urban planning. Uh, this paper is therefore supposed to make you more sensitive to contextual thinking and the realities of others. And while doing so, um, I will try to make you more, more conscious about your responsibility um, of the future of the cities and uh, from the point of view of the people. And here's the first question, which you can maybe think through uh, the presentation. What circumstances drive us to rethink urban planning in order to make it more viable, human, but at the same time system oriented? And the second one is how can urban planners? contribute to the development of more resilient city. I know the term resilient city is nowadays more used in technical way, but uh, I will maybe propose another feature of this, of this term. Um, so what I'm going to do now, in this paper I would like to theoretically explore social, social historical consequences of functional differentiation. Um, I'm explain, I will explain it soon. Uh, and connect it with the urban planning framework of Central Europe, or Central European countries, let's say. And let's do it. Okay, this is a uh, Louis Hans photograph uh, from the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, it's like example of, of, uh, uh, of let's say, um, farmers heading to the city, they might, they might be heading to the city, but what's behind it, it's, uh, it's uh, um, urbanization process which started with industrial revolution. So people tended to, um, tended to resettle in the cities which they, which they keep doing until today, and it's still intensifying. And what's behind this process, it's functional differentiation. Since you're in a city, you are not, you are not self-subsistent and you, um, you, must, you must rely on somebody else in order to, let's say, survive because somebody else must provide you your needs, uh, another, another products which you can buy. Uh, so another feature of functional differentiation, um, or it's interlinked, it's division of labor. I've, I think you know about it a lot. And um, so these guys, it's another example. You know, these guys, are, they are heading to the city and they are settled down in a city, so they become entrepreneurs, businessmen, it's businessers, businessmen. And what changed? They, they specialized. It's a specialization process which is behind this functional differentiation. 
And uh, as I noted, it was called Division, Lab Division of Labor by, by Emil Durkheim, quite famous sociologist at the, the, at the end of uh, 19th century. And he tried to see it as positive feature. It's, he perceived it as social glue. That since people uh, had to specialize, they stick to each other in cities. And later on, it was, it was coined with the term social cohesion. And it was reinterpreted by Chan. And I'm going to read his definition right now. It will be important in the next few slides. So social cohesion, according to Chan, is state of affairs concerning both the vertical and the horizontal interaction among members of society as characterized by a set of attitudes and norms that includes trust, sense of belonging, and the willingness to participate and help. OK, so what we have here is functional differentiation. So as Emil Durkheim see it as, saw it as a positive thing, I think we might, we might talk about negatives, which, we, which persisted until today. And it's broken communication, broken responsibility, and broken public interest. And I will examine all those separately. So in case of broken communication, um, this is a logic map of ARPANET. Uh, you probably know this is the forefather of internet. And um, it happened to be like the beginning of, of, of something which Anthony Giddens called informational society in 1990 in his book. But it's, it's like beautiful, you know, we like internet, we use it every day. But what's behind it, uh, negative, it's vertical stacking. You all might know what's happening every morning when you come to, the, to the work. You open your, let's say, two email boxes and you spend a lot of time doing, doing these, uh, these minor works. And uh, Thomas Hilland Eriksen, which is Norwegian anthropologist, called vertical stacking because he described what's happening uh, with your duties. Like you, all, all, your, all your things which you want to do is stacking vertically. So he somehow perceived it as if time would stand by, as everything was, would be so fast that it's still. You know, that you, st you, you live in, in one moment and history is over some, some, somehow. What else uh, I perceived as part of broken communication is something what Thierry Ramadier, which is a French um, philosopher, no philosopher, he is a psychologist, yeah. He, he termed, or he, he coined as disciplinary thinking. This is a picture what, which all our children or, or our pupils, they can see in a, in a school. Okay, what was telling us? That there's a, there are a branch of, lang, branch of sciences, but they perceive to, uh, or they, they contribute to one understanding or one tree or something like that. And what Ramadier was trying to say, that sciences developed in, in um, progressive and uh, one-dimensional way, okay? That due to, due to enlightenment uh, principles, there was still notion of progress that our science in, in these different fields can develop to, I don't know, where. That so, that so we are, until today, we are still developing these branches and usually separate, separately. So, uh, be disciplinary, disciplinary think in, in these, these terms, in these, these like tunnels, let's say. And this is the outcome. Um, the, knowledge, the amount of knowledge uh, is, is overwhelming and it's still growing. And okay, what, what to do? What, what, what to do? Uh, you, you can become the expert in one field, but in order to become expert in another, you, you must spend, I don't know, tens, tens of years of studies, and it's very difficult to comprehend all the knowledge by one person. So something what uh, Michelangelo could, uh, did, it's not possible today, not anymore. Um, and Clavans and Boyack was trying to somehow analyze uh, art, scientific articles. This is like outcome of seven million articles. How the sciences are still intertwined, but I think there's still a huge potential. We will talk about it later on. Another thing, broken responsibility. It's a bit difficult. Hopefully I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be puzzled by this. 
Um, Jean-François Lyotard, he, he in 79, in year 79 in his book, described, um, described something which he called fall of great narratives. Okay, enlightenment, it's gone. Uh, the progress, the, the unfinished progress, it's not possible. We are not, we are not anymore as Euro-American Euro civilization tied to one vision, let's say, or one goal that we will progress until, I don't know, until the end of the days. And it's tied to what, um, what Nietzsche called like end of the God or death of the God. That we are not united anymore by, by the religion. And there are different things uh, which, which support this, uh, this quote, fall of great narratives, or let's say, let's say Leotard's term. And when you transcend it into 90s and, and sociologist Ulrich Beck's notion of risk, risky society, he said, okay, now, now, now guys, since fall of great narratives is like what, what happened, then everything is, we are, we are responsible for everything. We must decide for everything, for what is truth, what is nature, what is God. Everything is based upon our consciousness, upon our uh, thinking, let's say. And it, it uh, pressures us very much because it, it, it makes us very much responsible. We, we don't realize how much responsible we are today, actually. So it's quite risky, according to Ulrich Beck. And, and to, to jump into the Czech uh, context, Czech philosopher Václav Bělohradský quite recently wrote an article and he was very, like, I don't know, if angry or he used the term idiocy. But we must look into Greek, uh, into the Greek language because idiocy is something separate or um, when, when, you, when, when they said you're an idiot then you're separate from somebody else or somebody else is thinking and you cannot perceive what, what's happening uh, behind your eyes or in some, in, through somebody else's eyes. So it's like a tunnel vision again. And Belohatsky thought that experts, which they, which they, they were raised through this functional differentiation for this division of, of thinking and experts, they cannot perceive what's happening in another discipline. So they are somehow idiotic. And yeah, it might, it might work quite wrong. And third thing is broken public interest. Um, Czech philosopher, Petr Drulak, he tried to think about the Czech democracy and uh, from the politi politi political point of view. And he intervened it with, uh, so with society, of course. And he realized that after 1990s, after Velvet Revolution, well, what we did, that we, we focused on individual um, growing, but to, to one-sided, that we, we saw uh, our individual freedom in a freedom to buy anything. In a freedom of market was everything. And it led to disintegration, it led to individualization, uh, for, according to him, extreme individualization. And since politicians were not, were not able to somehow um, to lead the, the discussion it, and, and grow public interest and they're not trying to find what's public interest in certain issues. They, it led to uh, disintegration, disintegration of community and politics of disinterest. We just don't care today, or usually, or many of us, according to him. So to summarize it, um, there are some bad things behind functional differentiation, uh, which, I, which I call broken communication, broken responsibility, and broken public interest. Okay, the major challenge for urban planners is to embrace state of these affairs somehow and evolve towards holistic way of thinking and willingness to collaborate, I believe. And how to do it? Well, I will try to make some, make some comments on it or propose something, but well, it's probably not enough. Hopefully, maybe one of you will dig deeper into it. So urban planners 
should become vision builders since they implicitly deal in long time spent with urban landscape. Uh, the product, which is a product and a template of human action. And hence, had they have responsibility to contribute not only to environmental development, but to cohesion of social actors whom the city serve. As William Shakespeare like noted, okay, city is a people. It's like easy. So it's like a new, new, let's say, a benchmark for urban planners, I believe, uh, it's to maintain social cohesion, or let's, let's at least think about it. And how to do it? There are two principles, which I think they are, they are fruitful for this task. It's transdisciplinarity, which is mainly related to scientific sphere, and it deals, it deals with this division of thinking. And in case of public sphere, it's participation and how to link them together uh, through urban planning, we must use, or we might use, the urban landscape. Uh, well, I used urban landscape notion quite freely, or this term quite freely, so don't, don't kill me. And now I will tell you a story before I go into, into these three, three pillars, let's say. Um, as the story, the story goes, uh, this is a map, as you noted, it's, it's an outcome of ethnographic mapping, which was done in Amazon at the end of, oh, well, I think the project started 2006 or something like that. And it was driven by the cooperation of Surui people, of indigenous group of Amazon uh, living in Brazil, and, and uh, Amazon Conservation Team, which is a non-governmental organization of that, let's say, established by Mark Plotkin, which is a renowned ethnobotanist. And what they did, they realized, okay, when we, when we, when we use uh, modern technology such as GPS and Google Earth and, and all these nice stuff, then we can mark uh, what is, what is uh, significant for our cult culture into the map, okay? That there is a lake, and uh, to the lake there's, it's tied a myth. It's myth. So the lake is important for our culture, and we were able to put it directly into the map. And it was built up in the cooperation with indigenous people and this organization. Um, and the outcome of this cooperation is just clear, because the borders, usually it, it is, this might be just something it's more or less um, big as, as the Czech Republic. So for, for tribe, it's very difficult to it's very difficult to uh, protect the borders. And as you know, the, they are, there are forces which drag source, resources of this, of this society from within, from, from within the borders, uh, such as um, gold miners, they, they encroached their, uh, their land and so on. And in order to protect it and in order to stand for themselves, they had to make a map, because everyone understands the map in the world of politics, and in our, in our world, everyone understands the map. So that's why this map was important. And this is a chieftain. It's Almer, uh, it's a chieftain of three people, and this is, I think, New York. And he was heading to headquarters of Google Earth, or Google, in order to get more detailed uh, pictures of, of this region or Amazon in general because really they, they used notebooks in Amazon in order to protect their lands. They were checking what's happening uh, from, from above and in order to protect it, it was quite useful. Okay, uh, what's behind the story? Nature, culture, distinction uh, was somehow interlinked in, in a term which Arturo Escobar called hybrid nature that uh, indigenous cultures, they somehow opened to resources or the technological improvements of the outside world and use it for themselves in order to protect their own notion of culture. Um, yeah, culture and nature as well. So it's somehow hybridized. The nature, nature is holder or is, it's, it's like a surface through which we, we, we establish our culture. For them, it's very strong, and I think that 
it might be useful even for, for uh, city developers. Okay, and I will, I will a, little bit, a little bit talk more about the science from uh, using, using this example. Anthropologists such as Arturo Escobar, uh, Aleta Biersak or Heinz Kunz at the late 90s they realized, okay, when we are trying to understand cultural adaptations to environments, we are something lacking here. Okay, we deal with the culture, nice, nice, nice. Because uh, uh, this distinction, or there was established distinction in sciences between the natural sciences, or life sciences, let's say, and social sciences, and they don't like that much, they, they don't like that much each other. I think it's this important point. And, and they, but they realize in order to understand what's happening in a field, since they are anthropologists, mm -hmm. they have to merge. They call it for new synthesis for system-centered paradigm or integrative science. And all, all this is interesting. It happened in 1999 in their uh, articles. So I don't know, maybe they are all friends or probably yes. And it ended up in development of new branch, ecological anthropology, which is holistic somehow. Okay. And um, what, can we, what can we use out of this, out of these examples, out of this example of scientific fields merging together, or at, let's say um, paradigms merging together in order to understand the world? Are our basic premises related to entities we call nature correct? Maybe, maybe not. And where's the city in all of this? Uh, how to use these examples in order to deal with the city? Because maybe the city is not that, it was beautiful before, but it's not nice now, never mind. The city is as ecology. It's not that, that difficult to understand. It's multidimensional, and the city is mainly the people. And in order to somehow develop the field of urban planning, it's it must, it must definitely become the basics of this, of this uh, thinking. Okay, and how to deal with the disciplinary thinking? How these, these problems based upon the, the development of society or Euro-American civilization, idiocy of expert thinking, politics of disinterest, and city is so, so difficult to understand. Uh, well, we must try multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, but at the very top, there is transdisciplinarity. Um, I think you've, you've heard about these words. They are, um, these fields are developing, developing quite fast. There's, there's a whole, whole social, um, whole, whole science discipline related to, to examination of multidisciplinarity. That those guys just sitting there and they are making researches. How, how does it work? And what's, what are problems behind multidisciplinarity when some people come together and try to use uh, each other's tools and points of view? What are problems behind it? But why transdisciplinarity is the most important? Uh, well, first of all, we must think to Basarab Nicolescu, which in 1996 uh, pro oh, made trans transdisciplinary manifesto and he wrote a nice article, I recommend it, and in which he distinguished between multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity, saying that, uh, it's better to read it, I guess. Um, yeah, that the, the last thing is the most, most useful because forms of multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity do not call into question disciplinary thinking. Uh, saying that those guys, they just, they just uh, group up in, um, in interdisciplinary teams, but they do not question each other's point of views. Yeah? And transdisciplinarity does, through the principle of articulation between different forms of knowledge. And there are different forms of knowledge, since, since science, uh, scientific branches were, were developed in this tunnel thinking, through this tunnel thinking. And, but how, how practically do it? He proposed three principles. It's logic of included middle. It's somehow mystical for me. Um, I don't know, he, he is a physicist, but in, in this article he, 
I don't know, he treated these words as a philosopher. So I really recommend, recommend it to read it, what's behind the logic of included middle. It's somehow, it's like a free space in between of sciences, which you can, which you can fill with the problems and you can, you can deal with these problems within this free space somehow. And these problems, they, they can, they can uh, somehow be related to these different sciences. Well, it's quite crazy for me, but it seems, it seems like useful for, for an intellectual point of view. Okay, another thing is coherence. Um, Teori Ramadie, he underlined that maybe the unity of knowledge is not the goal, okay? Because it, it makes, it makes these this, this knowledge departments um, like, um, how to put it, solid, or it's unpenetra unpenetrable when we want to uni unite our knowledge into, into something, something unified and we, are, we, are, we all as a scientist are contributing to this unification of this understanding and this understanding is one, dim one dimensional. According to Ramadier, uh, more important is looking for coherence of the knowledge, coherence of different branches of knowledges and we need to examine how these branches how these branches are related, how, how, they, how they can okay, fruit, fruitfully somehow intervene. This is what we need to look for in the future. Because there are different levels of reality and this understanding that uh, the world is multidimensional. You, as, as experts in diverse fields, you have your own point of view, your own understanding, your own, la your own language, your own terminology is based upon your education. So understanding that there are different levels how to understand reality, it's, it's the basis of transdisciplinarity. Okay, just still a little sketch. Um, I was trying to describe discipline as something like coherent or united and the multidisciplinarity, it links two disciplines, uh, interdisciplinarity, it can be used by one researcher using different methods, but not questioning the whole field. Okay, I'm going to the end, I'm um, reaching to the end. The, the, the second uh, principle or the second pillar, we can say, is participation. And I use very nice, I use a very nice definition of Ellen Fowler. It's a process through which stakeholders influence and share control over decisions and resources that affect, affect their lives. And why it's important? In case of our example of three, three project, um, the locals, they could influence not only the content, but the very, very framework of, of this project. Okay, they, uh, they influenced how, how the data Will be uh, will be gathered, and it was very nice nice cooperation between between like external scientists and, and local people. So it was based upon the principle of participation. It might look like that in case of urban planning and participatory urban planning. It's just important to note that people are let's say not experts in in scientific way or in in, um, or maybe in not, in not, not an intellectual way, maybe they are just dumb, but they are experts on what they live. They are experts on their own neighborhood. They know, they know what's important on, in neighborhood, what's important in their region, and they have right to say it. Yeah. And the third, it's like a catalyst, which can, which can hold those two principles together it's urban landscape or just landscape. Let's say that you have a project in the middle of the city and it's, it's tied to, um, it's tied to some like improvement of public space or something like that. So the landscape is, is covered. It's, it's like the world which can, which can unite the people, unite the stakeholders, unite the, the I don't know, local subjects, local firms, local NGOs, like everyone. And 
through this linkage, through this using this catalyst, or uh, we can we can build up something which we call a sense of community again, sense of community, rebuild what was which was lost maybe. And I, here I, at the end, I use somehow you will know very well. I think Rem Kulha said landscape is the only thing left that can link a city together. And in this way, he was thinking about the people. If city is again the people, we cannot underestimate the role of urban landscape in terms of identity construction and community belong belonging, as I said. And to put all these crazy things together, uh, I try to make a little definition of vision building or role of vision builder. And I think um, his role is to identify mobilize and facilitate transformative action via employment of local resources, citizens, and all relevant stakeholders, including transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary collaborators. Okay, and, and the goal, um, what should we strive, strive for, is exactly this, establishment of sense, uh, sense of community through landscape transformation. Um, in my article, you can, you can find out more why or how the landscape is tied to identity construction. So feel free, to, feel free to read it. And I think there might be something which I call participatory domino effect. And I will, I don't know if I'm to read it, but let's say I will do it, if, if you don't mind. I think it's, it's like very nice, or I think it, it works. There are many examples from around the world which, they, which, which support it. So once urban development is inclusive to all stakeholders, it provokes their willingness to participate on the future change. Act of participation encourages an inner creativity and motivates people to directly collaborate on realization of the specific goals. So okay, they, they use their own, their own forces, their own capital. But what's important, uh, maybe even more, creative process of finding consensual solution. So okay, we are dealing here with this broken public interest. We are building public interest. Teaches all participants how to discuss, understand, and tolerate the needs of others. Which is not, uh, which, is, which is quite useful, I think. And created public interest, it's, it's uh, outcome of this um, consensual <coughs> meeting, leads to investment of economical and social capital of those involved. Okay, people are just crazy to, to help you if, if, if all those steps worked. During the performance, urban landscape is symbolically connecting with shared feelings, experiences and stories of all participants. Okay, even in, even in C, CEO is, is human or is, is, is people, is, is man. So it, it connects even the feelings, feelings of all and experiences of all people, are all, all subjects. And transformated urban landscape generates happiness and satisfaction and builds a sense of community as the people develop a close relationship and a feeling of responsibility to the locality, which they inhibit. Um, sense of responsibility. That's, that's what is lacking in suburb which, where, the, where I work in Czerny Most. People just don't care about public space. We must change it. Acquired sense of community motivates all stakeholders to collaborate on bigger scale or different theme in the future. Okay, and um, coming back to the first, first picture. Maybe we are still like them somehow. Consistent, long-term and inclusive development of urban landscape, coordinated by a transdisciplinary team of vision builders and driven by the collaboration of all social actors, is an advanced power balancing process through which society may discover its future. And John Friedman, he said that uh, Planning is too important to be, let, to be left to experts or just to planners. So through planning, we can find our future or our goals, our visions. And I believe that it's, 
it's useful what I, what I just said and you might use it in your own work, in your own thinking and thank you for your attention. Anthropologist is interested in urban issues and urban life, so we started to talk with Pavel, we started to have a connection, and that's why he is the guest because mm -hmm. you're right that the connection between anthropology, social, social issues, and, and architecture is kind of you know blur still here. But we need to support this connection, so that's why actually he's, he's a part of this conference. Yes. All of you can work as field workers or like ethnographers, mm -hmm. going out, making notes and just observe. Observation, participatory observation, it's very basic, very basic tool and I think it's fruitful for all sciences. I think just don't start with, with saying that okay there are some kind of borders. No, there are no borders. No, there are no borders. Okay, uh, I will show you our cooperation, how we started to cooperate with uh, architects or Operation Prague 14. It's like a minor work, quite fast, but we were asked by the young studio Manua to, to give the lectures uh, to their students. They were students from Liberec, students of architecture, and they were appointed to, um, to find the solutions or go to the field and find the solutions for local interventions. And so they grouped in a group of two people and they went to certain parts of Prague 14. Prague 14 is Černý most, Hloubětí, in its eastern part of Prague. And so they went to the field, as I did, uh, well, I, I accompanied them once, and they were <coughs> observing and trying to find what doesn't work in public space and how, how with a low budget and in short time and maybe using, using locals how can we um, develop, develop, this, develop this situation or, or um, change the situation? Sorry. So it was our first collaboration with architects and they were so nice, they were so passionate about understanding the people because nobody taught them at the school. Nobody taught them how to deal with the people. Um, so it was nice. And in next year we will um, push, push our, our efforts um, more and we will do um, Street for Art, it's festival of public space. It was done six times in an eastern or no, in southern part of, of Prague, or, um, I'm sorry, and this year it was for first time in Chernimov Street for Art. And next year it will be, it will be finally um, done through, co through collaboration with locals. Okay, they said, nice, we have, a, we have like micro, uh, micro regions of Prague 14, it's quite uh, fragmented, let's say, and in all micro regions we will do a festival. We will help locals to do festival for themselves. It will be partly cultural, partly dealing with public space, cooperating with Manua and using the findings or proposing the finding, or propo proposing the solutions of those young architects to the locals, trying to involve them and do something with environment or, or public space and saying and, and naming it festival. But who, how, how did this initially you know, start? Who yeah, was the initiator? <laughs> Story of Anthro Pictures. <laughs> okay, it started with this project. Oh, well, no, yeah, let's say this one. This, this was the main one. Um, year, or it's year and a half ago, I met David Kaspar. He is a cultural producer and he's a direct, former director of Street for Art. And he had a lecture about um, festival in public, <coughs> in public space at suburbs. And he was, he, he was uh, describing how difficult was to cooperate with locals, how difficult was to uh, involve them. And after lecture, I asked him, David, did you, did you collaborate with anthropologists? No. Okay. That's, that's how, how it started, because at that moment, he, 
he had become director for culture at Prague 14, and, and giving a chance to do something more experimental by the mayor of Prague 14. He had a like, budget, nice budget, and a lot of, lot of free, a lot of space, a lot of, potent, a lot of opportunities for doing something extraordinary. That's, how he, that's why he um, in, uh, invited us to do community monitoring as a basis for fulfillment of the goal of Prague 14. Prague 14 said in cultural strategy, okay, in the next 15 years, we want to have strong uh, communities. Okay, how to start? We must map what's, what's down there at this moment and start to work with something. Yeah? So that's what we did uh, through community monitoring. It, we found like 115 community communities, let's say, and we defined or identified um, potentially community, uh, community activities, which people do separately, but they can be somehow um, linked, it can be, link, it can be linkage for them. And it's quite long, it's like a database. In next year, it's, it's great. It's like experimental field because Mayer let us to establish a new institution, which we call local coordinator. Great. Thank you. Great. <laughs> yeah. And using the knowledge of community monitoring, which is time limited, space limited, okay, we, want, we wanted to do something permanent, something sustainable. So we proposed, okay guys, you need in those micro regions uh, coordinators, which will know which will know locals, local communities. At the same time, they will know how, how, uh, um, how the municipality works, what is necessary to do when I want to change something, when I want, to, I want to have a new, I don't know, playground or whatever. And at the same time, it will help horizon, on a horizontal level. Uh, the coordinator will help to, um, to, collab or to cooperate with each other, those communities, because they don't know each other. They don't know each other. So this is, another, this is another project for next year. It will be huge. And I'm really looking forward because it's, we are now, we are now developing it, this, this whole concept. You went to Prague 14. That was your location. Yes. When you went to the, when you were basically doing this project with the locals, did you already uh, like meet or identify or do they exist like like some organized groups that are doing basically things around the neighborhood and you know and were you working with them or does it exist you know do do these neighborhoods have their own like initiatives you know like existing ones or it was informal we were looking for informal uh, relationships and connections among the people not the formal but. It, for formalized, for, formalized, it's like NGOs, for instance, um, civic association. I think Občanské združení. Yeah. Yeah, two. Uh, I, well, well, I have limited time. One month working in in a place where are twenty five thousand people resettled. So I, I collaborated with NGOs in order to get deeper. I could start it on the street. I could have started on the street, but I wanted to found like opinion leaders and real social social actors. Okay, uh, thank you for Pavel for a really interesting presentation. Nature is not something uh, unattached from the people. Nature is not going to tell us what to do. Okay, even even life sciences scientists, even though they think that their their modes of of uh, work or their approaches are objective, but they are not. There are nice there are nice books um, about how about about the thing how how even a natural or knowledge related to nature is is culturally driven or as how it's how it's, how it's culturally based and i was trying to say that 
since the nature is inflicted or uh, is, is tied to the culture or culture can be seen through the nature in case of, of Syrian people because when they start to tell you about the importance of roads, of trees, then their culture is so tied to the nature that if you resettle them, then you destroy your, their culture, cultures. It has a connection with the city too, because it's our world. And even though you might be, you might be critical about it, you, every day you go through the city and there are certain points, and there are certain places, and which you, you relate to your experience, to your stories, to your, I don't know, love affairs or like whatever. So city, in this sense, is ecological. I know that you do the research in Amazon, as far as I understood in your CV, and also in Prague, in Czerny Most. So I'm interested if there is any resemblance or if there's anything that you experience in Amazon and in Prague 14, and if you can exchange these experiences and use the outputs of what you learned, if there's some, some connection, something, you know, because it's completely two different fields. But we are all people, no? <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm trying to see the connections. And in case of Peru, I lived two months, or oh, one month, I was in Peru two months, and one month I lived with indigenous community of Ashaninka people. And my project was related to ethnobotany and visual anthropology, and it's quite far from what, um, what I was talking uh, about here. But still, I lived with them. And I was observed that there is a sense of community, and it's this sense of community is again, it's very much tied to the, to, the, to the landscape around them, to the environment. And when I was doing my research in suburb, in Prague, <coughs> I didn't have this feeling. Why? Okay, uh, set, um, the structure of settlement is different. It was not small, small, small community, and it was family-like community. And what's, what can connect it the sense of community can be built there, but it's not there now. And we did a research which we called uh, community mapping. And even, even you might say that, okay, suburb, it's individualized, it's fragmented, people, they, they, they just do what they, would, what, they own, what they want on their own. And there's no community, okay, how, how comes there could be a community? Um, but we found communities since we worked in this, in this field as anthropologists. There are not many, but they can be used as a snowball in future if city supports their efforts to, to develop what they need. We are trying to examine this problem from different points of view, as you understand. Okay, so it's best to team up with the others 